Hello and welcome to the second space lesson and we're going to be looking at the life cycle of a star. Just a reminder that all the space physics is physics only so you don't need it in combined science. For this lesson you're going to need a pen, some paper or an exercise book. You do need to take quite a lot of notes in this topic. There's quite a lot of new content and a lot of things that you're going to need to recall, particularly the key terms. Unless you're needing to watch this video on your mobile phone, get it out of the way and silent and just try and avoid any distractions that you can. Straight away onto the starter then. I want you to describe the differences that you can see in these pictures of stars. If you think back to the black body radiation lesson that's in the waves topic, there was some part of that lesson that did look at stars and black body radiation. I'll give you two minutes. Just 40 seconds left. I'm hoping that all of you have managed to get the two obvious things. First obvious thing, the stars are different in their sizes. You might have put diameters or you might have put masses. That's number one. And number two, obvious, the different colours. If you then think back to the black body radiation topic, you should have remembered that the, the spectrum of light, the colour of light that's emitted from any object depends on the temperature of it. If an object is at a hotter temperature it gives off more black body radiation but also because that radiation has got more energy it becomes a smaller wavelength, a greater frequency. So the red colour of two of those stars there represents a cooler temperature, still hot but a cooler temperature than the white, and the white is a cooler temperature than the bluey white stars. The bluey white stars are at the, the highest temperature range. So temperature and size, they're the two main things, and we're gonna need that because it will fit into the life cycle. First outcome, we're gonna fairly simply describe the life cycle of, of different sizes of stars and what happens during the lifetime of a star. The difficulty here isn't really the physics understanding. The difficulty is making sure that you recall all the different steps and you know the different types of stars along the way. And the other outcome is to link the changes in stars over their lifetimes to the forces that are acting within them. We touched a little bit 
on that about the sun and the first lesson of the space topic. I want to start off with this amazing object that you can all see in the night sky. Uh, I'm recording this at the um, middle to end of October. And that constellation Orion, very famous constellation, very easy to spot, is about due south as I'm leaving for work in the morning. So six or seven o'clock, it's about due south. As the winter goes on, it will appear earlier and earlier. So by the time we get to the end of the winter, you'll be able to see it as soon as it's going dark. What makes it easy to spot is it, it takes up quite a large part of the night sky and the stars that it's made up of are quite bright. But there's a, a string of three across the middle that we call Orion's belt. So that's a point of interest. There's three stars there. Another point of interest, there's a very large red giant called Betelgeuse, which does hit the scientific news and the main news fairly recently. It's a super red giant and it's quite unstable and it's fluctuating a lot. So it's a potential for something really exciting happening at some point over the next half a million, million years. Don't hold your breath while you're waiting, but if we really look, it could happen in our lifetimes that it could go supernova and it'll be quite an amazing feature in the night sky for a couple of weeks. The point I want to focus on now, though, if I just take those lines away, so that's the way that it would look. You'll, you'll find it easy to spot if you'd be bothered to spend a couple of minutes looking for it. Is that point underneath the belt? There's a couple of very interesting features there, but the middle one is the one that I want to focus on to start with. And that is a nebula. We talked about nebulae in the last lesson. And a nebulae is a cloud of dust and gas. And it's where new stars and, and stellar systems, we don't call them solar systems unless we're talking about the planets around our own sun, but stellar systems where they're being formed. And that nebula that's got the exciting name of M42, sounds like a motorway, is 1,344 1, light years away. So if you're travelling at the, the speed of light, it would take 1,344 years to reach it. In universe terms, that's relatively close. It's visible quite clearly with binoculars as well. You will see a, a fuzzy picture because of all the dust and gas that's in there. What I want you to, now, to do now is to remember from last lesson and explain to me the processes that led to the formation of the solar system from a nebula. Include as much detail and time scales that you can. And you've got two minutes. Just coming up to halfway through your time.
normally about five steps. We've got the nebula. The nebula shrinks under its own gravity, rotates, starts to form into a disk instead of it being a sphere. The centre of it starts to get hot, and as it heats up, we call that a protostar. It's a sort of star just before it gets going. And then eventually that will get hot enough and there'll be enough pressure that we'll get nuclear fusion and we'll, we'll get the sun, the sun being born. So if you've put any timescales down, about 4.85 billion years ago, the planets then form out of the remaining material in the disk collapsing under gravity. And then those planets, after a, a bombardment 10, 100 million years of smashing into each other and picking up all the debris, they'll clear their own paths and you'll end up with the orbits of the planets that we have now. So we need to now describe the life cycle of stars. Let's talk about the first bit because the first bit is going to be the same for all stars. So a nebulae or a nebula, if we're talking about one, is formed from a dying star. So a star dies, all the material from that star ends up as a huge cloud of dust and gas, slowly collapses under gravity and the most dense centre of that collapsing nebula heats up and you get a protostar. And a protostar, it's not got nuclear fusion, but it will get hot up to about 3000 Kelvin. This then collapses more under gravity until eventually the temperature and the pressure is high enough for you to get nuclear fusion. And then we've got a star that we describe as a main sequence star and it has this long period of being stable. So that's the same start for all stars. Remember that to start with. What I want you to do now, again thinking back to last lesson, I want you to explain what a main sequence star is and why it remains stable. We talked about it being in equilibrium. Again, include as much detail as you can and any time scales that you can remember. That picture there is of the sun, but it's taken using a special filter that so we can see the detail. We've got solar flares coming off on the side and you can see the hotter areas on the surface. Halfway through your time. The thing that you're most likely to get asked about a main sequence star is to explain why it's stable. And you should recognise that from last lesson. So anything, anything in physics that's in equilibrium, that's stable, whatever forces are on it, they must be balancing each other out, cancelling each other out. 
So any object in space, it's got gravity. So gravity is trying to collapse it down. It's trying to pull it all together into a smaller, a smaller volume. But that then, in a stable star, a star that's in the main sequence, will have nuclear fusion, the heat and temperature, and the pressure pushing back out because of fusion. So while those two things stay in equilibrium, the star will carry on doing what it's doing. And the sun has been doing that for around about 4 billion years. Let's just make sure we're OK with nuclear fusion then. It has come up before. It's in the atomic structure topic and it's examined in the, the other physics paper. It's in paper one, whereas all the space unit is in physics paper two. So let's just check that we're clear understanding of it. So nuclear fusion is, is a reaction in which two or more atomic nuclei combine to form one or more atomic nuclei. So we're taking smaller nuclei and forcing them together so that they stick. So we make bigger nuclei. And we normally get subatomic particles, neutrons and protons coming off as part of the process as well. For this to happen in stars, we need huge pressures and temperatures in order that we, we force the atomic nuclei close enough together for them to be able to stick. And when a star's in the main sequence, it's forcing hydrogen nuclei together into helium nuclei. So that's the first element in the periodic table, forcing them together to form the second element in the periodic table. Just be careful that you don't use the word atom when you're talking about nuclear fusion. If you were to get a normal atom, so say a hydrogen atom that's got a proton and an electron orbiting around it, if you were to make that very, very hot, it would turn into what's called a plasma. Here, there's so much energy that the electron's got too much energy and it won't orbit, it's not stuck. So it doesn't end up being an atom because the electron won't be orbiting around it. It's always an ion or a nuclei. So just be careful with the words that you use, otherwise you could drop a mark. Stars then differ through their lifespan. So we call it a life cycle that they have. And that's just a sequence of different stages where different things are happening. And the life cycle, as I've said, for all stars, it starts off the same. To start with, it's the same. Then we have a divide, dependence on its size. So small, small stars, and by small stars, I'm talking about the sun, it's a relatively small star and then much bigger stars have a bit of a more of a, a dramatic life cycle. Now you're going to need to recall this sequence for smaller and larger stars. So you're going to have to remember it as part of your revision. And you're also going to be expected to recall a little bit of detail about what's happening and why it's happening. Not a lot, just a little bit. So not in any particular order. I'm just going to talk about things that we see in the universe and humans have been studying probably forever. So nebulae, not really that visible for the human eye, although there are some like M42 under Orion's belt that's just about visible, but it, it's quite difficult to judge what it is until you look a bit more closely. That's the cat's eye nebula and it's a cloud of material. That nebula there is what's left over when a smaller star has died. So you can see the remnants of the smaller star there and the, the outer material has been blasted off. So we've got all that dust and gas. In the future, if there is a person around in the future looking from afar at our solar system, they'll see something like that because the sun will end its life by doing that, by turning into a nebula. So our main sequence star, just a reminder again, that's taken with a filter. So our star, the sun, it looks like that. We can see the detail on there. If you were to start looking at all the stars that you can see, 95% of them, possibly even more of the stars that you would see would, would be in their main sequence. They would be stable because the stable 
for a very long period of time. The bigger stars aren't as stable for as long. They tend to go through their life cycle a lot quicker. But nearly all the stars that you can see are like that with differences. Red giants then, or a super red, a red super giant, which is just a bigger version. I said Betelgeuse top left of Orion is a super red giant. And a small proportion of stars that we observe, the bigger and the cooler. The cooler temperature means that they don't give out the same spectrum of light. It's cooler, so it's more red, so they look more red. It makes them look redder. Now we're starting to get to sort of specialised, really interesting stars here. So we've got a neutron star. Now, big stars go through their life, turn into red supergiants, and then they tend to collapse under gravity as they're getting towards the end of the life. Now, they collapse to an incredibly small size, only 10 kilometres across. So this huge, massive super red giant collapses down, becomes incredibly dense and hot, but incredibly small. So a matchbox sized piece of neutron star would weigh 3 billion tonnes. So they've got the total mass of a bit more than the, a bit more than the, the sun, but they collapse down into a tiny, tiny volume. Also, they were first discovered because they behave very, very oddly. Initially, scientists thought we were getting a signal from space from aliens. They spin incredibly fast and some of them give out a beam of radiation. So as they're spinning, we get this, this pulse of radiation that we pick up like a signal, like someone flashing a torch at us. So these were called pulsars because they pulse on and off. And they were discovered by Jocelyn Belbonnell and Anthony Hewish in 1967 and that was the very first evidence of neutron stars. A supermassive star, Etna Carini, exploded way, way before the life had evolved on Earth and that gives us what's called a supernova, an exploding star. There's been evidence around for a long time. We, we, we see these things much easier through a telescope, but you can see them. But now we do occasionally stumble on a star actually collapsing and blasting into space as a supernova. And we can record it live and you get this huge burst of electromagnetic radiation and light for a few weeks where it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly bright. On average, in each galaxy, you might get one every 50 years. Now this slightly dull diagram is straight out of the AQA specification and it shows a flow diagram going from the top down to the bottom that describes how stars change as they go through the life. So if we had one of these for a human, we get birth at the top, We'd have baby, we'd have toddler, we'd have teenager, we'd have adult, and we'd have old person going from top to bottom. So it's, it's sort of a straightforward flow diagram, but you'll see it divides after main sequence. So main sequence stars can do two different routes. If they're small, like the sun, they'll turn into red giants, then white dwarfs, then black dwarfs. I'll talk you through that in a minute but the bigger stars much more exciting instead of a red giant you get a red super giant it's just a lot lot bigger and then that can supernova the end bit that you get left over from the supernova depending on its size can either turn into a neutron star or it can turn into a black hole this is a slightly more interesting version of the same thing and i've just blanked out to start with the large stars so we can just talk our way through the smaller stars to start with so we've got our stellar nebula we've got a project proto star and then we've got our stable main sequence stage then 
as the star reaches the end of its life, it'll turn into a red giant. So our sun will do this. It will probably swallow up the, the rocky planets, including the Earth, as it, as it does so, as it gets bigger. And then it will start to, to lose a lot of the outer material and turn into a planetary nebula. So a lot of the, a lot of the material from the sun will end up drifting away into space. What will be left over, though, will be a denser lump of material that is still quite hot, that collapses down into a, into a very small planet size star. Now, when we reach that stage, the white dwarf, it won't have any nuclear fusion anymore. It'll just have the leftover heat. So for millions of years afterwards, it will slowly cool, which is why it will go from a white dwarf. That means it's hot and small to a black dwarf, which means it's cold and it's small. So by the time it reaches that black dwarf stage, it will resemble a planet pretty much. Now, there was a question on AQA exam paper a couple of years ago. It talked about a brown dwarf that would just be somewhere in between where it's not quite completely cooled down. Let's look at more massive stars then. The star's the same, nebula and protostar, but this time some stars end up forming out of much more material, so they formed out of much more hydrogen. That will mean that they're bigger, but it can also mean that they can burn hotter and burn for a shorter period of time, so the lifespan of the bigger stars tends to be a lot less. The very massive, really, really massive stars can have a very short lifetime. So it goes through the main sequence stage, but it's just it's massive. And then it starts to run out of hydrogen and it'll turn into a red supergiant. So it cools and goes uh, a lot bigger. But then it can collapse in on itself and explode, forming a supernova. And then depending on how big it was, it can leave a neutron star behind. The diagram that we've got there is representing a pulsar. We've got a beam beam of electromagnetic radiation coming out as it spins or a black hole but way out there in space there's huge clouds of dust and gas and if one of those clouds of dust and gas is massive enough its own gravity causes it to start to collapse so it falls in on itself and towards the centre of that cloud, it gets denser and denser, it gets hotter and hotter. And eventually, the particles that the, that the gas and the dust are made of are brought so close together that they start to stick together, they start to fuse. That's the energy source of a star. The star switches on and begins to shine. Inside every newborn star, hydrogen atoms are fused together to make helium. This process is called fusion and it creates the energy that powers every star. What happens to a star during the rest of its life depends on how massive it is at its birth. A star like the Sun is in a delicate balance between gravity, which wants to make the star collapse in on itself, and the pressure that pushes outwards that comes from the energy that's been produced in these fusion reactions happening at its core. However, at some point in the future, the hydrogen runs out. And at that point, the core of the star will start to collapse in on itself under its own weight. It gets denser, it gets hotter, until a point where you can actually start to use the helium atoms themselves as the fuel for the fusion, pushing helium atoms together and making carbon and oxygen the next heavier elements in the periodic table. As the star begins to fuse helium, it creates more energy and that causes the outer layers of the star to expand. One day, our sun will grow so large it will swallow up the inner planets of the solar system, out as far as the Earth. It will become a red giant. For the sun, this will be the beginning of the end. What happens is that the outer layers of the star get farther and farther from the middle. The force of gravity that they feel is getting weaker and weaker. And actually, the star loses hold of its outer atmosphere. Its outer atmosphere drifts off out into space. It expands out to become a planetary nebula. And they're some of the most beautiful objects in the universe. Once the outer layers have drifted away, all that is left of the star is its core. A white dwarf star is the dead remnant core of a star like the Sun at the end of its life. What's left behind is something that might weigh as much as half the mass of the Sun, but it's only about the size of the Earth. 
So it's an incredibly dense object. It's dead. There's no nuclear fusion going on it anymore. It's incredibly hot, but then over millions of years, it will gradually cool down to become a black dwarf. Some stars, however, are much more massive than the sun, and they lead very different lives. They are able to fuse heavier and heavier elements inside their core. The star gets bigger and bigger. Some grow up to a thousand times the size of our sun until it has fused elements all the way up to iron. And once we've formed an iron core, there's no more energy can be got from fusion. That core collapses. The rest of the star starts to collapse in after it, but then it bounces off. There's a huge shock wave, and in just a second, bang, the outer parts of the star are blasted off into space in a huge supernova explosion. These supernova explosions are so powerful that when one of these stars explodes, it can actually outshine the whole galaxy of which it's part, a galaxy of maybe 100,000 million stars. For these supergiant stars, all that is left is the super-dense core, known as a neutron star, an object that can have a mass greater than our sun, but be less than 20 kilometers across. But for the most massive stars of all, we think when the core collapses, the gravity is so strong it becomes a black hole from which not even light can escape. So stars are actually the, the places in the universe where the elements are created. After the Big Bang, our universe contained only hydrogen and helium. All the other heavier elements were therefore fused inside stars. The amazing thing is that virtually everything you see around you was made inside a star billions of years ago before the sun and the planets were formed. And when that star died and blasted its guts out into space, that formed the raw materials from which our sun, the planet Earth, and indeed ourselves were made. And actually, I think that ultimately that's one of the, the major reasons why I think understanding stars is crucial, because it's actually telling us where we came from. Let's look at explaining these changes then and talking about the forces. So we've got our main sequence star and we know that's in equilibrium. So we've got hydrogen being fused together to make helium, nuclear fusion. But when that's run out and we get that change from a main sequence star to a red giant, which is going to happen to the sun, it becomes bigger and cooler. Now the reason it gets bigger and cooler is because gravitational force inwards is less than the force from fusion outwards, so it's pushed bigger. And that's as the heavier elements are made through nuclear fusion, just pushing it out, particularly the outer layers of it. And then this isn't a direct change, but we, uh, the red giant here will eventually turn into a white dwarf, so it's much smaller than the original, so it's shrunk. So if it shrinks, that must be because gravity is greater and that's because nuclear fusion has stopped in a white dwarf. It's just got its heat from where it was before and eventually it'll cool. So the elements then, we've got helium being made in the main sequence star. For stars like the, the sun of that size, when it turns into a red giant, we get some bigger elements made, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, but nothing heavier than that. And then in a white dwarf, we've got no more elements being made because we've got no more nuclear fusion. So again, same starting point, but in a much bigger star. Here, it's much bigger and we've got much more pressure forcing atoms together. So we can manufacture inside the core heavier elements still. So we can still make the oxygen and carbon like the sun will be able to. But also we can make heavier elements like magnesium and silicon all the way down to iron. Iron is very difficult to fuse into anything else. So for a normal star, that's your limit to what you can make. So the iron that we have on Earth in the ground was manufactured in the centre of a bigger star sometime in the past. So as that star swells, it's because the gravi gravitational force inwards is less than the force from fusion outwards. So it gets bigger. A star like a super red giant could eventually supernova. 
and form a black hole afterwards. A black hole is incredibly small and dense. So because it's collapsing, it must be that you've got gravity and there's nothing else. Gravity is forcing it into a smaller and smaller point. So the gravity is so extreme, not even light can escape. That is there, an actual picture of a black hole. It's the first actual picture of a black hole that was taken quite recently. You'll see it's got that glowing around it. Even though light can't escape from a black hole, you do get radiation given off as other material is accelerating down into it. So helium made in the main sequence, elements all the way up to iron made in a super red super. So here's our red supergiant again. That could then supernova. So the supernova is an explosion, but the explosion isn't the first bit that happens. To start off with, it collapses. It collapses as the fusion is, is stalling because of the elements that you've got left, mainly the iron. So it suddenly collapses because we've not got the pressure from the fusion holding it up. But as it collapses, it starts the fusion again. And this time it's the fusion of much heavier elements being forced together just for a split second. That fusion to make the heavier elements then causes a burst of heat and pressure, which blows the whole thing apart, and blasts all the outer part of the red supergiant into space. And that's, we would then see that as a supernova outshining a galaxy for a couple of weeks. So elements up to iron made in a red supergiant and the heavier elements made up to uranium and gold in a supernova. So if you've got gold jewellery, all the atoms in there were made of a supernova in the past. And that supernova has manufactured your gold and then it's been blasted into space and then it's just managed to settle in our planet. And then someone has dug it out and found it, turned it into jewellery. We can get some of the other heavy elements including uranium and gold made when we get neutron stars colliding and also possibly black holes colliding as well the huge impacts there can cause some heavier elements to be manufactured a little progress for you then based on what we've just done i'm going to give you two minutes just six questions and the answer to each question is just a particular stage that we've talked about in the life cycle of stars Halfway through your time. Right, give yourself a mark out of six then. So question one, at which stage 
is experiencing balanced inward and outward forces, so that's main sequence stars. So much gravity light can't escape, number two is a black hole, fusion not started yet, so that's a protostar. Elements up to iron be fused, so that's the core of a red supergiant, so not a red giant, we wouldn't get up to iron made. Store the core still hot after nuclear fusion has stopped, so that's a white dwarf. And where are elements heavier than iron are formed, so a supernova explosion, you, you could but collide in black holes or neutron stars there if you like. On to a couple of exam questions then to finish us off. I'm going to give you three minutes for these five marks and it's an explain question. So you're giving, you're giving the reason why that's happening for part A and part B. Three minutes. We should be getting on to part B now. minute left. Should be just about finishing. Okay, self market then. So, the protest starts, it's a lower temperature, so you can get a mark for that. It's got, or a protest star does not emit radiation energy. That's well, it's not true because anything that's above absolute zero will emit electromagnetic radiation and protostars can be up to 3000 Kelvin. So they would emit a little bit of off white colored light. So I'd prefer you go with a lower temperature. And the most important bit for you to remember, there's no nuclear fusion reactions yet. So part B, it's by nuclear fusion don't use the word atoms there and don't mention nuclear fission. That's something that we use in a power station to split atoms. So it's fusing, it's fusing nuclei together and it's hydrogen that's been fused together to make helium. 
and then the heavier elements, heavier than iron, are formed in supernova. And lastly, question two, three marks, it's a describe question. So you're talking about the stages that it goes through here. And it's a more massive star we're talking about. You won't get any marks if you start talking about the life cycle of stars that are smaller like our sun. Just coming up to halfway through your time. You should be just about finishing. So you've got on then, self market again. So we've got that expansion into a red giant. That again, dodgy stuff going on here. It should be a, su a red super giant because we're talking about stars that are bigger than the sun. You can talk about it contracts and explodes, or if you just say so it becomes a supernova, that's fine. And you've got a choice of what you say here because again, it depends on its size. So it could form a neutron star after the black car after the supernova. So the the remnants of the material at the beginning could form a neutron star, or if it's a little bit bigger and you've got a little bit more gravity, it can collapse that little bit further into a black hole. Three marks altogether. I'll leave you with a summary then. There's a lot of content in this lesson. So most importantly, look at the top right. You've got that flow diagram that's from AQA. Not very exciting but make sure that you can write that out. And then when you know that you can write that out, make sure that you can explain what's going on at each stage and why it would turn from one stage to another. We've got formation of the solar system that I've put again on the bottom right and the balanced forces in a main sequence star and also a little bit about the elements that are made. A red giant I've put on there and a supernova. But do make sure that you've got enough notes and do make sure that you check that you can remember them. Right, I'll see you next time for lesson three in the space physics topic.